This morning, I want to continue our series that we started a couple weeks ago. Every day is game day. Matter of fact, look at your neighbor and say, every day is game day. You know, as a Christian, we got to realize that every day matters. And so we've started this series, and uh, we love to use things of our culture that, that interest us, and God got an amazing way to bring biblical truth into that, and that's what we're doing. And today, I want to talk to you on the part of knowing your opponent. Knowing your opponent. You see, a football team, when they get ready to play, they got to get ready for themselves. But if you go listen to a football coach, they'll tell you, we've got to get ready for who we're about to play. We got to know their tendencies. We got to know how they're going to run the ball, pass the ball, how they're going to play defense, how they're going to do special teams, their trick plays. We've got to study them and know how to play them. Well, the same way as a Christian. As a Christian, we don't just show up in life and do it we got to understand that there is an opponent to our life. The Bible calls him Satan, who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. you got to realize that your opponent, your adversary, is playing for keeps. He is playing to derail your destiny and to destroy your hope. He is coming against your family and your children and every aspect of your life. So today we want to talk about how to know your opponent. Know his schemes and his plans for your life. Because just like we know and trust that God has a plan for you, we also know the adversary has a plan to take you out. And we've got to recognize that. I remember, and, and I don't remember the game, it was before my time, uh, but there was a year that Alabama was going to the Rose Bowl. And so they had, and that time in juncture, that was before Bear Bryant had taken Alabama into the wishbone era. Can you imagine trying to go back to that now? But before they run their wishbone. And so they were a regular pro passing team. So they were going to the Rose Bowl to play a team that was much better than them at this juncture. So for that whole month leading up to the Rose Bowl, they changed their whole offense. They went from a pass-oriented football team to a wishbone, but the team that they were playing had no idea. They were preparing for the other way that Alabama played. When we got to the Rose Bowl and they opened up with the wishbone, it just surprised everybody. And matter of fact, it was such a surprise that the whole game, the other team could never play defense real well against Alabama. And Alabama actually ended up winning that game even though they were big underdogs in that Rose Bowl. Why? Because the opponent that they were playing did not know how to defend what they were about to do. Because the opponent did not know what was coming their way. I hear people saying all the time, well, if I would have just known, I would have reacted differently. So today, I want to talk to you for a few moments on how to deal with the opponent of your life. Now, let me make very clear here, and I want to read a scripture to you here in 2 Corinthians 2 and 11. It says, so that Satan might not outsmart us, so we can make sure that we know where he's coming from, for we are familiar with his evil schemes. Now, let me open up and say something right now. There are a lot of Christians in America that do not believe in a literal Satan. There are a lot of people that do not believe that, that they believe that he is a symbolic figure of evil, but he does not exist. Let me make very clear in this house right now that the Bible talks distinctly about Satan. It says that he used to be an angel of light in heaven, but he rebelled against God. And the Bible says Satan not a symbolic symbol of evil, but evil itself, the Bible says, fell out of heaven as of light lightning. He came to this earth and he became king of this planet for just a while, but that he's real. Do you know that the greatest trick of the adversary in humanity is to get people to believe that he does not exist? I'm going to say it again. The greatest accomplishment of the enemy is to convince mankind that he does not exist. Why is that important? If you don't believe he exists, you won't fight him. If you don't believe he exists, you won't prepare for him. I want to state right now that there is absolutely a demonic evil spirit, a demonic power. His name is Satan. He fell from heaven. But can I give you some encouraging hope before I move further? He is not all powerful. He is not all knowing. He is not all capable. He is not omnipresent, meaning he is all places at one time. He can't do that. He's already been thrown out of heaven by the power of God. Let me show you how this worked. He was in heaven. He was with God. He decided in his heart, I'm going to take over. 
How fast did he fall? The moment he thought that, he hit the ground on earth. Why? Because God don't play that game. How powerful is God that one thought cast Satan down from heaven? I'm not here to preach on his power because God's already defeated him. I am here to tell you how to deal with him in your life and how to deal with the evil in this world. So Satan is real, but you got to understand how he attacks. What's his scheme? How's he going to come against your family? How's he going to hit your marriage? How's he going to destroy your kids? How's he going to steal from you the destiny in which God has created you to live out? That's what we want to talk about. You see, in the Bible, we see two different occasions where Satan actually had a one-on-one encounter with people. One time in the Old Testament with Adam and Eve in the beginning and with Christ on the mountain of temptation. Both of these occasions, we see that he, gets, he come against the first Adam and the second Adam, which is called Christ. In both occasions, we can see how Satan wants to come against you. So today, I want to talk to you about how to recognize the attack of the enemy on your life so that you can win the game of life and with Christ. You see, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, the serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, I want you to get this. Now, what I'm about to illustrate to you is a conversation. God had already told Adam and Eve, I want you to get this picture. Everything in this beautiful garden is yours. Nothing will be withheld. You have the ability to, to live and to breathe. Everything is yours. Everything. Somebody say everything. Everything is yours. But one thing. He said there's one area, there's one tree that you're not to touch. Don't touch that tree. For the moment that you eat of that tree, you shall surely die. God gave them everything. So that's where this conversation comes up. The serpent who was the shrewdest of all the wild animals of the Lord God had made, one day he asked the woman, I want you to see how he reacted. Did God really say, Satan will always try to make you doubt God? He said, Do you, did God really say you must not eat any of the fruit of the trees in the garden? The first thing that Satan did with Adam and Eve was try to cause doubt. Causing doubt in what God said and who he was. God didn't really mean don't touch that. You see, that's how the adversary plays today. He tries to create doubt in your mind. He tries to make you doubt God. He tries to make you doubt that God loves you. He tries to make you doubt that God cares for you. He tries to make you doubt that God can forgive you of your sins. He'll try to tell you, you've done too much. You've sinned too much. You've fallen too much. God doesn't love you. You're just broken. God can't care for you. He don't care for you because you don't have enough of this, that, and the other. And so many people will believe the lie of the adversary. But I've come by to tell somebody this morning that God does care for you. God does love you. God does have a plan. He says, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. God loved you so much that before you were born, he was already creating a plan for your life. David said he knew me in the bosom of my mother's womb. He knew me when I was in darkness. The Bible says that the thoughts of God are so countless that they're greater than the sands of the sea. God loves you. The devil is a liar, but he tries to get you to doubt. Doubt God. Doubt does he exist. Doubt does he care. Just doubt. You see, James 1 and 8 says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. You see, if God, if the devil can make you doubt God, he throws you off balance because you become unstable. And once you become unstable in your thinking and in your belief system, now he can just corrode you and knock you over anytime he wants to. Number one, the adversary tried to make Adam and Eve doubt God. He tries to make you doubt God. Secondly, he tries to make you doubt God's intentions for your life. Do you know what he said to Adam and Eve? He said, ah, God is keeping something from you. You ought to eat of that tree. If he was a good God, he would give you everything. Can I just stop and tell somebody, sometimes God says no, not because he doesn't love you, but because he loves you. 
There are some doors God will not open because he sees that's a door you don't need. Because he can see things you don't see. He can understand things we don't understand. You see, it's like a parent with their kid. There are sometimes your kids will go, well, Dad, why can't I? I don't understand. And you say, because, son, I just know better. This is not good for you. They don't understand at the moment, but you do. There are some times that God will keep certain things from you because you're not ready for them. Because it's going to cause you more harm than good. Why? Because God loves you so much that he wants to provide good stuff for you. The Bible says all good things come from the Lord. And you see right here, Satan was telling them, you know what, I want you to get this picture. He told Adam and Eve. He said, I can't believe God's holding that back from you. I mean, he just, I, I don't understand it. What's he keeping from you? Can I tell you right now, God's not trying to keep anything from you. He wants to bless you. He wants to provide for you. How do I know that? Because when all of humanity was dying and going to hell, when all of humanity was separated from God because of the sin of Adam and Eve, whether it's fair or not, I, I, I told Ginger, I said, if I see them in heaven one day, I'm going to have a long conversation with them kids. I'm like, why in the world? What was you thinking? Because all of sin came to this planet because of the reaction of Adam and Eve's disobedience to God. People will say all the time, I can't believe a good God would, would let bad things happen. Do you know that while I'm preaching, there's probably going to be a three-year-old uh, child in Kenya that's going to die today because of malnutrition. You see, we're taking a team in October to go to Kenya, Africa. We go every two years. This church, and I just want to applaud you, this church supports over 500 children in Kenya, Africa. Is that not amazing? Thank you. But somebody today is going to be in a tragic accident. Some, somebody's going to get bad news today. And now we'll hear people say, well, why is a good God allowing bad things to happen? Why is God doing that? You see, you've got to understand, God did not cause sin to come into this earth. God did not cause bad things. Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Do you know why bad things happen? Because mankind would not trust God. Because mankind disobeyed God. Because mankind, when Jesus or God said, don't touch this, they disobeyed. Sin is not a God product. It's a product of disobedience from mankind. Let me show you how great God is. God is so good that he could have easily have said, you know what, mankind has fallen, they have sinned. So you know what he could have done? He could have wrapped up like we do an old piece of paper and wrapped it up in humanity and threw it away and said, we're just going to start all over. But you know what? God loved us so much that he did not just say, let's start over. He said, let me make a way when there was no way. He said, instead of just giving in, let me redeem that which is fallen. True love is not that which can love the perfect. True love is that which can love the broken. That kid you can pick up that person who has fallen. I'm so glad that when we were broken for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish when we were broken God sent the greatest prize that heaven had in his son Jesus Christ why are we able to sit here today because when humanity was dying and going to hell God made a way when there was no way when we could not do it ourselves God did for us what we could I wish somebody would give him praise for what he done You see, Satan wants you to doubt God's intentions. That's, that's something you got to understand. He wants you to doubt God. He wants you to doubt God's intentions. He wants to divert your focus. How do I know that? Because when Satan was in the garden with Adam and Eve, you know what he pointed out to him? He did not say this. He did not say, whoa, you serve a great God. Look at all these trees and fruit trees and animals that you're in control of. Man, look at the miles and miles of blessing that God's given you. No, Satan will never point out God's goodness in your life. Do you know what he done? He went to Adam and Eve and he pointed out the one thing God said don't touch. Isn't it amazing? Your kids, they won't want to touch something until you tell them not to touch it. And when you tell them not to touch it, they're going to get up at 3 in the morning and sneak in there and just say, touch it. Come on now. 
That's our human nature, is it not? We're going to go touch what we're not supposed to. But you know what Satan does? He tries to change your focus. He tried to get Adam and Eve instead of looking at, look what God's done for you. Look how he's blessed you. Look how he created for you. Look at how it's 70 degrees, 68 degrees all the time. My Lord, I can't wait for 68 degrees in Mobile, Alabama. Anybody agree with that? I laughed and told somebody one time, I said I could do a series on hell every August and we would have a 101 degrees this coming Wednesday. I praise the Lord. But the truth is, Satan did not tell him all the great things that was around him. He just said, look at the one thing you can't have. You see, Satan will always try to point out to you what you don't have. He will always try to divert your focus from the good things God's doing for you. See, some of us, we're so focused on the negative part of what's not there and what we don't have and what somebody else has. And, well, if God loved me, I wouldn't be struggling. Listen, everybody's going to struggle. Everybody's going to face a storm. Everybody's going to go through something. No one is exempt from hard days. But as a Christian, we're so blessed that in our hard days, there is one who is a closer than a brother. There is one who walks on the water of the storms of our life. There is one who makes a way when everybody else says it's impossible. There is one who shows up no matter what time it is. If it's in the midnight hour, God shows up. If it's at 2 o'clock on Tuesday evening, God shows up. If we're all by ourselves, God will show up. I've come to tell somebody, I know the devil wants you to see all the bad, but God said, I come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. It is time that we focus on the good things that God is doing. I wish somebody would just praise you for something good in your life right now. Don't tell me about the bad. Tell me about what God's doing in your life right now. Find a reason. Let everything that has breath praise ye the Lord. Pastor, I can't because if you can't, you're deceived by the adversary. His ploy is just like he did Adam and Eve. Take their focus off of their good and make them see the bad. You see, it's deferred our focus. That's how he works. Not only that, he wanted us, Satan wants you to doubt consequences. This is really big in the society that we live. This is very important to hear this. You know what he told Adam and Eve? He said, eat. They said, we can't eat. God said, if we eat, we shall die. You know what he said? I want you to catch what Satan said. Surely you will not die. Why did he say this? Because God wants you to think that there are no consequences to sin. I want to say it again, that there are no consequences to sin. He said, you won't die. God loves you too much to let you die. God didn't really mean that. You see, we live in a society right now that it's live your own life. Do your own thing. But I've come by, as long as I'm your pastor, I'm not going to preach what society wants me to preach. I'm going to preach, thus saith the word of God. And I know that culture... I know that culture, I'm just going to lay, I'm going to let everybody be seated real quick and, and get seated because this is so important. I don't want no distractions in this moment, but I need you to hear me. I want you to understand that the adversary wants to distract you into believing that you can do anything you want to do with no consequences. He is a liar. Just like he said to Adam and Eve, do what you want, live like you want. Don't worry about what God says. Just do what feels good. Our culture says the same thing. Just do what feels good. Do what you want to do. It doesn't matter what God's word says but what the devil's doing is setting you up for fa failure setting you up to fall for the Bible says the wages of sin is death I want to say it again there's a price to pay for doing your own thing you don't have to live in sin sin holds you back sin corrupts sin entangles sin kills sin steals joy sin takes away from hope sin feels good in the moment but it doesn't mean it's going to last Satan will only show you a momentary pleasurable moment he doesn't show you the result of hurt and love and despair and the scarring of all that's going on but I've come by to tell somebody today you don't have to live in sin Jesus said whom the Son sets free is free indeed you can be set free of sin in the name of Jesus 
We live in a culture. You see, I love you so much. As your pastor, people say, well, I don't hear the message of sin preached much. We don't preach the message of sin and anger or hate. That's wrong. Because God loved us when we were in our sin. For when we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The message I'm preaching is that of love and hope. And that I love you enough to tell you, you can't just live any way and go to heaven. We live in a culture that says there's many ways to God. That you can do anything you want to and go to heaven. That's not true. The Bible simply says there's only one way to God, and that's through Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. There's only one way to heaven, and that's through forgiveness of our sins by the blood that was shed at Calvary by Jesus Christ. And you see, the adversary would let you to think there's no consequences. Listen, there's consequences to pornography. There's consequences to what the society we live in is sexual freedom. There's no such thing as sexual freedom. Let me tell you what sexual freedom is. Sexual freedom is a husband and a wife that have been married enjoying the benefit and the goodness of God inside the confines of that marriage. That is sexual freedom. Come on, does anybody still believe that? Anything outside of that causes all kinds of problems I don't have time to get in. But the adversary wants you to doubt consequences. You see, this is what Satan done in the garden. This is how he operates. Doubt God. Doubt his intentions. Doubt consequences. Doubt, doubt God's love for you. But I want to tell you something right now. How do we deal with that? What do we do when Satan comes in to try our, our, our opponent, our adversary, comes in to try to take from us? This is what we do. We understand what Christ did. On the mountain of temptation, he was tempted three times. I want to give you a verse because people say all the time, well, look, Jesus, the Bible says he was tempted like me, but he has never been tempted with chocolate cake. He's never been tempted with with that or this because pastor that wasn't even there but how so how could Jesus have been tempted like us well the Bible shows us how and I want to read this to you in first John chapter 2 verse 16 for everything in the world the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes the pride of life there's three categories I want you to catch this the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes and the pride of life all three of these come not from the Father, but of the world. The Bible says all sins fall into these three categories. Again, let me say it again. Every sin that you've ever committed or will commit comes under these three categories. Lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, pride of life. What you see, what your flesh wants, and the pride that we have that we can do it ourselves. How do I know that Jesus was tempted in all these ways? On the mountain of temptation, the Bible says that Satan tempted him three different ways the Bible says he was there and Satan said if thou be the son of God can I just tell you that God Satan will always try to make you doubt who you are in Christ I want to say it again he will always cause you to try to doubt who you are listen don't doubt if you know that you're a son and daughter of Christ you know that you're more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ that he loves you and that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you don't doubt that he went to Jesus and said, if you're the son of God, this is what he said. Imagine this. Take, because Jesus had been fasting for 40 days. Come on. For 40 days, he had had nothing to eat. And here comes Satan and says, if you're the son of God, take this rock and turn it into a loaf of delicious bread with some butter on top. With steam coming off the top. I'm just kidding. Turn it into a loaf of bread. If you're the son of God you know what he was appealing to lust of his flesh he was tempting him in something his flesh wanted desperately in that moment let me tell you something you there's nothing more in this world you would want if you've ever fasted any amount of days I'm telling you, there's nothing more that you want is I'm telling I was fasting there's been many times I've been fasting and I could smell a cheeseburger from three counties away I'm just telling you right now if you haven't ever fasted, I'm just telling you, it's real. The, you, you can just sense a cheat. Mm. 
Jesus was tempted in the one area that his flesh wanted the most. And Jesus said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. Lust of the flesh. Then the Bible says that Satan took him to the pinnacle of a temple. And he said, okay, if you're Jesus, throw yourself off the temple. Because the angels will catch you, the Bible says. If you're Jesus. You know what he was was talking to? The pride of life. He was tempting him to be prideful and showing him who he was. Jesus said, no, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Then he took him to a tall mountain. A high mountain. And he said, look over this mountain. Jesus, do you see all that beauty, all the landscape? All of this is yours if you'll just worship me. Now he was tempting him with lust of the eye. So Jesus was tempted with lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and the pride of life. The three temptations that everybody will at some some point in your life be tempted in. He was tempted. Why is this important? Because you need to understand your opponent. You need to understand how he's going to come against you. So, Pastor, what do I do when he comes against me like this? How do I stand? Well, here it is. I'm going to give you, in the next 10 minutes, I'm going to give you four ways to stand against the adversary. Okay, number one. Number one, this is what your response has got to be. You've got to draw near to God. This is world changing, I know. You've got to draw near to God. How do I know that? The Bible says draw near unto God and he will draw near unto you. I want to show you something. Temptation, this is an important statement. Temptation is a test of your relationship, not your self-control. I want you to understand what I'm saying. It's like my wife. I want to give an example. We've been married for 26 years. And when I, I am just paying all the attention I need to to her and loving her like I should, the closer I get to her, I don't have to look out here. I'm going to help somebody here in a moment. The reason, and I, the reason you're looking, if you're married everywhere else, is because you're not as close to your spouse as you should be. And I have found that the closer I'm with her, the more I'm in love with her, the more I focus on our relationship, the closer I get to her, do you know why? Then I don't want nothing out here. Come on. I'm not tempted out here when I'm right where I need to be right here. The reason why some of us are tempted all the time is because we're not where we need to be with God. And so therefore, we're not focused on God, we're focused on everything else. And when you step away from your walk with God, now temptation gets harder. How do I know that? I want to show you a scripture right here that speaks to this. Psalms 91 and 1. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Pastor Dylan, come up here and join me real quick. Quickly, quickly, quickly. Yes. He's not quite as quick as I am, but he's doing good. Why don't you stand right there? Now, I don't know if you can or can't see and if the cameras can show down to his feet a little bit, but there, that right here, there is a shadow because of that light right here. Okay, I want to show you what this scripture means in Psalms 91. It says that when I go close to God and I get in his shadow, I'm okay. The problem is, for me to be in his shadow, I can't stand way over here. And when I get over here, no longer am I focused on God. So now I'm over here, and now everything becomes to tempt me. Everything looks better because now my eyes are diverted from where they should be. What I should be focused on is God. But the closer I get to God, matter of fact, when I get into his shadow, that means I've got to be within this distance right here. And the Bible says that when you get into the shelter of God and go draw close to God, well, pastor, shouldn't God draw close to us? He did when he sent his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross and rise again on the third day and make a way for humanity. That was God drawing close to you. So now you, have, you and I have a responsibility. If we want to be, yes, we're going to be tempted, but if we want to stand in face of temptation, get closer to God. Get into his shadow because the closer you get to God, the less everything else looks to you. The, 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 the less everything else attracts you. The less the other stuff of this world pulls at you. But the reason why so many people are pulled to everything else is because you've gotten away from God. Can I announce to somebody, it isn't that God has moved, it's that we move. But God says, I love you so much that I'm here waiting for you to come right back to where I am you see you're tempted because of where you're positioned your spiritual life you see can I be honest with you 
You can't just go anywhere and do anything. The reason why some of us are entangled again is because there's some relationships you need to walk away from. Some of us need to get off Facebook. Do you know more affairs are happening now because of Facebook? Because people are connecting again with people of their past. I'm just being open and honest. Listen, let me just be real with somebody in the house. Your Facebook, your phone, your computer, every social media thing that you have, if you're married, your spouse ought to have the password, ought to look at it anytime they want to without you getting huffy about it. Because if you don't have nothing to hide, you ain't got nothing to worry about. Come on, somebody. I'm preaching in the house. I said, if you don't have nothing to hide, you don't care I'm looking at it. Ginger, what is your password? Just kidding. (laughs) Are you following me? We must get along with God every day. So number one is get close to God. Number two, real quickly, how do we fight the enemy? 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 and 9. How do we deal with when he attacks us? Three things, be alert and sober-minded. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. I love this. He is looking, look, he is looking for someone to devour. Right now, do you know the adversary is looking for somebody that he can destroy your life? It is up to you and I to stay alert, sober-minded. He says, he goes on, resist him, standing firm in the faith. So there's three things here the Bible tells us. One, it tells us that you have got to stay alert. Two, you've got to resist him. Three, you've got to stand firm. How do we stay focused? Galatians 5 and 1, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. Do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. How do we stay alert? We recognize, listen, Recognize what has caused your downfall in the past and stay away from it in your future. The Bible says don't be entangled again. That means if you're not careful, the same trap and the same sin and the same junk will pull you back. Why am I preaching this? I love you enough that I don't want to see you go back. I want to see you press forward into the calling that God has for you. You will be entangled again if you're not understanding of how the adversary is coming. So you've got to make a decision that I'm not going back. I'm going forward. That may, that may mean you've got to change some things in your life. Is it worth it? Is your marriage worth changing some things? Is your children worth changing some things? Is your future worth changing some things? Listen. I want to say something to you. You do not have to resist a temptation tomorrow that you eliminate today. What does that mean? There's some temptations that are only there because of how we, you and I, have positioned ourselves. So we got to be sober-minded and understand that. Number three, how do we face the adversary? We got to resist him. Pastor Kyle, if you would. We got to resist him in our thoughts. Do you know where the adversary attacks you in your mind? He attacks you in your mind and he'll lie to you in your mind. So how do we resist him? Submit yourselves, the Bible says, then unto God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. You gotta resist. You've got to push back against the sin. Don't just give in to it. You see, the lie of the devil is, ah, no consequences. But I'm telling you, it's a lie. You gotta resist in the thoughts. That's why you got to cast down vain imaginations, every argument that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and you've got to bring every thought, somebody say every thought, into captivity to the obedience of Christ. He'll attack your mind. Worry starts there. Depression starts there. Anger starts there. Sexual uh, perversion starts there. All these things start there. What you do with, you see, the sin is not in the thought. It's not getting rid of the thought once it comes there. Because a thought that's not dealt with will become a lifestyle. You got to throw it down. How do we resist the devil? Get our minds right. Whatsoever things are pure, holy, just, of good report, if there be any virtue, think on these things. 
in a culture that will not tell you this. You want freedom? There it is. You have the ability to throw down the thoughts that shouldn't be there. The devil will tell you you're not enough. Throw it down. The devil will tell you you've sinned too much. Throw it down. The devil will tell you there's no hope for your tomorrow. You have to throw it down. The devil will tell you you're not good enough. Throw it down. The devil will tell you you're going to fail again. Throw it down. Don't, don't just sit there and think on it and meditate on it. The Bible says if there be any virtue, any good thing, think on these things. You've got to resist him in your mind. And then fourthly, when the adversary comes and he will come. It is not a question of if he will attack. It's a question of when he will attack. You've got to stand firm in your faith. You've got to stand firm. You know what that means? That means you can't be shaky to the point of, oh, I don't know if I can. You can. I can. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Listen, football, if I could use this analogy. Football is about approaching and gaining ground. The team that can push the other team back will win. For you to win, you got to stand firm in your belief in God. Somebody needs to hear me. You got to make up your mind, that's for me and my house. We're going to serve the Lord. And when the devil comes in and hits me, I'm going to stand firm. When he tells me I can't, I'm going to stand firm. When he says I will not, I'm going to stand firm. Why? Because I've got to stand for my family. I got to stand for my kids. I got to stand for this church. I got to stand for the dead. Come on, you got more. It ain't just about you. I said it's not just about you. Stand firm in your faith. What? So how do we do that? you got to know what you're standing on. Jesus told Peter, he said, upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He said, upon this rock, the rock of foundation. You see, the storms can come. The winds can blow, life can get hard, but I don't have to drown in that because as long as he is in my boat, as long as I stand upon him, it doesn't matter what the doctor says. I thank God for the doctor, but the Word of God trumps that. I understand all the problems of life, but God's Word trumps all the problems of life. I understand mountains, but God's Word says I can speak to a mountain by faith, and it has to move. I've come to tell you today stand firm and I'm closing this message is so important because it affects every one of us in this house you know in this church I told I told one of my staff this week I said this church is not about the numbers, it's about the stories behind the numbers. It's about the stories of the people. Like every one of you in here, you matter to this church. The devil will try to lie to you and tell you you don't matter. He's a liar. He's the author of confusion. People matter because people matter to God. And your story matters. Let me tell you why your story matters. Because God, you were created to do something amazing for God. And there's other people's lives are depending on what you do with yours. Why does the devil want to take you out? Because if he can take you out, look, look, Ginger, stand. If the devil can take you out, then the people that are connected to you, he can slow them down. If he can take you out, it's going to affect your kids. If he can take you out, it's going to affect that level of influence that God's given you, and it's going to bring confusion to other people. See, he wants you, but he wants those around you. Do you hear me? Why is what I'm saying so important? you got to start recognizing. you got to stand because other lives depend on what you do. It's not just about you only. So what do we do? the praise team comes we put on the whole armor of God I'm not going to get into that how dumb would it be and I'm, the whole armor of God is the helmet of salvation the preparation of peace the breast praise of righteousness all of this I don't have time going all that 
What would happen if you turned on the tube today to watch a football game? And there was this crazy lineman out there with no pads on, no helmet, no pads, no knee pads, no shoulder pads. He walked out there in swimming trunks, and he walked out there in flip-flops. Come on. I know what you'd be saying. That's the dumbest guy I've ever seen him. He's about to get killed. Come on. He's going to get hurt. That's crazy. Because in football, you're given equipment to wear for a reason. To keep you from being injured. Because you're going to get hit. Football is a contact sport. Guess what? Christianity is a contact sport. I said Christianity is a contact sport. How do I know? Because I've been run over. But I've run over the adversary sometimes also. Come on, somebody. Listen. How crazy is it to go out there without a helmet? How crazy is it to go out there without dress for success? It won't happen. I said, you won't see it today. Then why is it that you're expecting to fight the Christian fight? For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, rulers of darkness in this world. How is it that we think we can go out there not dressed with all that God's given us? God has given you every tool that you need to not only stand, but advance the kingdom of God and be victorious in the name of Jesus.